Chapter forty three of Far from the Madding Crowd. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter forty three. Fanny's Revenge. Do you want me any longer, ma'am? inquired Liddy at a later hour that same evening, standing by the door with a chamber candlestick in her hand and addressing Bathsheba who sat cheerless and alone in the large parlour beside the first fire of the season. "'No more to-night, Liddy.' "'I'll sit up for master, if you like, ma'am. I'm not at all afraid of Fanny, if I may sit in my own room and have a candle. She was such a childlike, nesh young thing, that her spirit couldn't appear to anybody if it tried, I'm quite sure.' "'Oh, no, no, you go to bed. I'll sit up for him myself till twelve o'clock, and if he has not arrived by that time, I shall give him up and go to bed, too. It's half-past ten now. Oh, is it? Why don't you sit upstairs, ma'am? Why don't I? said Bathsheba, desultorily. It isn't worth while. There's a fire here, Liddy. She suddenly exclaimed in an impulsive and excited whisper, Have you heard anything strange said of Fanny? The words had no sooner escaped her than an expression of unutterable regret crossed her face, and she burst into tears. "'No, not a word,' said Liddy, looking at the weeping woman with astonishment. "'What is it makes you cry so, ma'am? Has anything hurt you?' She came to Bathsheba's side, with a face full of sympathy. "'No, Liddy, I don't want you any more. I can hardly say why I have taken to crying lately.' I never used to cry. Good night." Liddy then left the parlour and closed the door. Bathsheba was lonely and miserable now, not lonelier actually than she had been before her marriage, but her loneliness then was to that of the present time as the solitude of a mountain is to the solitude of a cave, and within the last day or two had come these disquieting thoughts about her husband's past. Her wayward sentiment that evening concerning Fanny's temporary resting-place had been the result of a strange complication of impulses in Bathsheba's bosom. Perhaps it would be more accurately described as a determined rebellion against her prejudices, a revulsion from a lower instinct of uncharitableness, which would have withheld all sympathy from the dead woman, because in life she had preceded Bathsheba in the attentions of a man whom Bathsheba had by no means ceased from loving, though her love was sick to death just now with the gravity of a further misgiving. In five or ten minutes there was another tap at the door. Liddy reappeared, and coming in a little way stood hesitating, until at length she said, "'Mary Ann has just heard something very strange, but I know it isn't true, and we shall be sure to know the rights of it in a day or two. "'What is it?' "'Oh, nothing connected with you or us, ma'am. It's about Fanny. The same thing that you've heard.' "'I have heard nothing. I mean that a wicked story has got to Weatherbury within this last hour, that—' Liddy came close to her mistress and whispered the remainder of the sentence slowly into her ear, inclining her head as she spoke in the direction of the room where Fanny lay. Bathsheba trembled from head to foot. "'I don't believe it,' she said excitedly. "'And there's only one name written on the coffin cover.' "'Nor I, ma'am, and a good many others don't, for we should surely have been told more about it if it had been true. Don't you think so, ma'am?' "'We might, or we might not.' Bathsheba turned and looked into the fire, that Liddy might not see her face. Finding that her mistress was going to say no more, Liddy glided out, closed the door softly, and went to bed. Bathsheba's face, as she continued looking into the fire that evening, might have excited solicitousness on her account even among those who loved her least. The sadness of Fanny Robin's fate did not make Bathsheba's glorious, although she was the Esther to this poor Vashti, and their fates might be supposed to stand in some respects as contrasts to each other. When Liddy came into the room a second time, the beautiful eyes which met hers had worn a listless, weary look and when she went out after telling the story they had expressed wretchedness in full activity. Her simple country nature, fed on old-fashioned principles, was troubled by that which would have troubled a woman of the world very little, both Fanny and her child, if she had one, being dead. 
Bathsheba had grounds for conjecturing a connection between her own history and the dimly suspected tragedy of Fanny's end, which Oak and Boldwood never for a moment credited her with possessing. The meeting with the lonely woman on the previous Saturday night had been unwitnessed and unspoken of. Oak may have had the best of intentions in withholding for as many days as possible the details of what had happened to Fanny. But had he known that Bathsheba's perceptions had already been exercised in the matter, he would have done nothing to lengthen the minutes of suspense she was now undergoing, when the certainty which must terminate it would be the worst fact suspected after all. She suddenly felt a longing desire to speak to someone stronger than herself, and so get strength to sustain her surmised position with dignity, and her lurking doubts with stoicism. Where could she find such a friend? Nowhere in the house. She was by far the coolest of the women under her roof. Patience and suspension of judgment for a few hours were what she wanted to learn, and there was nobody to teach her. Might she but go to Gabriel Oak? But that could not be. What a way Oak had, she thought, of enduring things. Boldwood, who seemed so much deeper and higher and stronger in feeling than Gabriel, had not yet learnt, any more than she herself, the simple lesson which Oak showed a mastery of by every turn and look he gave, that among the multitude of interests by which he was surrounded, those which affected his personal well-being were not the most absorbing and important in his eyes. Oak meditatively looked upon the horizon of the circumstances, without any special regard to his own standpoint in the midst. That was how she would wish to be. But then Oak was not racked with incertitude upon the inmost matter of his bosom, as she was at this moment. Oak knew all about Fanny that he wished to know. She felt convinced of that. If she were to go to him, now at once, and say no more than these few words, what is the truth of the story? He would feel bound in honour to tell her. It would be an inexpressible relief. No further speech would need to be uttered. He knew her so well that no eccentricity of behaviour in her would alarm him. She flung a cloak round her, went to the door and opened it. Every blade, every twig was still. The air was yet thick with moisture, though somewhat less dense than during the afternoon, and a steady smack of drops upon the fallen leaves under the boughs was almost musical in its soothing regularity. It seemed better to be out of the house than within it, and Bathsheba closed the door, and walked slowly down the lane till she came opposite to Gabriel's cottage, where he now lived alone, having left Coggan's house through being pinched for room. There was a light in one window only, and that was downstairs. The shutters were not closed, nor was any blind or curtain drawn over the window, neither robbery nor observation being a contingency which could do much injury to the occupant of the domicile. Yes, it was Gabriel himself who was sitting up. He was reading. From her standing-place on the road she could see him plainly, sitting quite still, his light curly head upon his hand and only occasionally looking up to snuff the candle which stood beside him. At length he looked at the clock, seemed surprised at the lateness of the hour, closed his book and arose. He was going to bed, she knew, and if she tapped it must be done at once. Alas for her resolve! She felt she could not do it. Not for worlds now could she give a hint about her misery to him, much less ask him plainly for information on the cause of Fanny's death. She must suspect and guess and chafe and bear it all alone. Like a homeless wanderer she lingered by the bank, as if lulled and fascinated by the atmosphere of content which seemed to spread from that little dwelling, and was so sadly lacking in her own. Gabriel appeared in an upper room, placed his light in the window-bench, and then knelt down to pray. The contrast of the picture with her rebellious and agitated existence at this time was too much for her to bear to look upon longer. It was not for her to make a truce with trouble by any such means. She must tread her giddy distracting measure to its last note, as she had begun it. With a swollen heart she went again up the lane, and entered her own door. More fevered now by a reaction from the first feeling which Oak's example had raised in her, she paused in the hall, looking at the door of the room wherein Fanny lay. She locked her fingers, threw back her head, and strained her hot hands rigidly across her forehead, saying, with a hysterical sob, "'Would to God you would speak to me and tell me your secret, Fanny! Oh, I hope it is not true that there are two of you! 
If I could only look upon you for one minute, I should know all. A few moments passed, and she added slowly, And I will. Bathsheba in after times could never gauge the mood which carried her through the actions following this murmured resolution on this memorable evening of her life. She went to the lumber closet for a screwdriver. At the end of a short, though undefined, time she found herself in the small room, quivering with emotion, a mist before her eyes, and an excruciating pulsation in her brain, standing beside the uncovered coffin of the girl whose conjectured end had so entirely engrossed her, and saying to herself in a husky voice as she gazed within, "'It was best to know the worst, and I know it now.' She was conscious of having brought about this situation by a series of actions, done as by one in an extravagant dream, of following that idea as to method which had burst upon her in the hall with glaring obviousness, by gliding to the top of the stairs, assuring herself by listening to the heavy breathing of her maids that they were asleep, gliding down again, turning the handle of the door within which the young girl lay, and deliberately setting herself to do what, if she had anticipated any such undertaking at night and alone, would have horrified her, but which, when done, was not so dreadful as was the conclusive proof of her husband's conduct, which came with knowing beyond doubt the last chapter of Fanny's story. Bathsheba's head sank upon her bosom, and the breath which had been bated in suspense, curiosity, and interest, was exhaled now in the form of a whispered wail. Oh! she said, and the silent room added length to her moan. Her tears fell fast beside the unconscious pair in the coffin, tears of a complicated origin, of a nature indescribable, almost indefinable except as other than those of simple sorrow. Assuredly, their wanted fires must have lived in Fanny's ashes, when events were so shaped as to chariot her hither in this natural, unobtrusive, yet effectual manner. The one feat alone, that of dying, by which a mean condition could be resolved into a grand one, Fanny had achieved. And to that had destiny subjoined this rencounter to-night, which had, in Bathsheba's wild imagining, turned her companion's failure to success, her humiliation to triumph, her lucklessness to ascendancy. It had thrown over herself a garish light of mockery, and set upon all things about her an ironical smile. Fanny's face was framed in by that yellow hair of hers, and there was no longer much room for doubt as to the origin of the curl owned by Troy. In Bathsheba's heated fancy the innocent white countenance expressed a dim triumphant consciousness of the pain she was retaliating for her pain with all the merciless rigour of the Mosaic law. Burning for burning, wound for wound, strife for strife. Bathsheba indulged in contemplations of escape from her position by immediate death, which, thought she, though it was an inconvenient and awful way, had limits to its inconvenience and awfulness that could not be overpassed, whilst the shames of life were measureless. Yet even this scheme of extinction by death was but tamely copying her rival's method, without the reasons which had glorified it in her rival's case. She glided rapidly up and down the room, as was mostly her habit when excited, her hands hanging clasped in front of her as she thought, and in part expressed in broken words. Oh, I hate her, yet I don't mean that I hate her, for it is grievous and wicked, and yet I hate her a little. Yes, my flesh insists upon hating her, whether my spirit is willing or no. If she had only lived, I could have been angry and cruel towards her with some justification, but to be vindictive towards a poor dead woman recoils upon myself. Oh, God, have mercy! I am miserable at all this." Bathsheba became at this moment so terrified at her own state of mind that she looked round for some sort of refuge from herself. The vision of Oak kneeling down that night recurred to her, and with the imitative instinct which animates women she seized upon the idea, resolved to kneel and, if possible, pray. Gabriel had prayed, so would she. She knelt beside the coffin covered her face with her hands, and for a time the room was silent as a tomb. Whether from a purely mechanical, or from any other cause, when Bathsheba arose it was with a quieted spirit, and a regret for the antagonistic instincts which had seized upon her just before. In her desire to make atonement she took flowers from a vase by the window, and began laying them around the dead girl's head. 
Bathsheba knew no other way of showing kindness to persons departed than by giving them flowers. She knew not how long she remained engaged thus. She forgot time, life, where she was, what she was doing. A slamming together of the coach-house doors in the yard brought her to herself again. An instant after, the front door opened and closed. Steps crossed the hall, and her husband appeared at the entrance to the room, looking in upon her. He beheld it all by degrees, stared in stupefaction at the scene, as if he thought it an illusion raised by some fiendish incantation. Bathsheba, pallid as a corpse on end, gazed back at him in the same wild way. So little are instinctive guesses the fruit of a legitimate induction that, at this moment, as he stood with the door in his hand, Troy never once thought of Fanny in connection with what he saw. His first confused idea was that somebody in the house had died. "'Well, what?' said Troy blankly. "'I must go. I must go,' said Bathsheba to herself more than to him. She came with a dilated eye towards the door to push past him. "'What's the matter, in God's name? Who's dead?' said Troy. "'I cannot say. Let me out. I want air,' she continued. "'But no, stay, I insist.' He seized her hand, and then volition seemed to leave her, and she went off into a state of passivity. He, still holding her, came up the room, and thus, hand in hand, Troy and Bathsheba approached the coffin's side. The candle was standing on a bureau close by them, and the light slanted down, distinctly enkindling the cold features of both mother and babe. Troy looked in, dropped his wife's hand. Knowledge of it all came over him in a lurid sheen, and he stood still. So still he remained that he could be imagined to have left in him no motive power whatever. The clashes of feelings in all directions confounded one another, produced a neutrality, and there was motion in none. "'Do you know her?' said Bathsheba, in a small enclosed echo, as from the interior of a cell. "'I do,' said Troy. "'Is it she?' "'It is.' He had originally stood perfectly erect, and now, in the well-nigh congealed immobility of his frame, could be discerned an incipient movement, as in the darkest night may be discerned light after a while. He was gradually sinking forwards. The lines of his features softened, and dismay modulated to illimitable sadness. Bathsheba was regarding him from the other side, still with parted lips and distracted eyes. Capacity for intense feeling is proportionate to the general intensity of the nature, and perhaps in all Fanny's sufferings, much greater relatively to her strength, there was never a time when she suffered in an absolute sense what Bathsheba suffered now. What Troy did was to sink upon his knees with an indefinable union of remorse and reverence in his face, and, bending over Fanny Robin, gently kissed her, as one would kiss an infant asleep to avoid awakening it. At the sight and sound of that, to her, unendurable act, Bathsheba sprang towards him. All the strong feeling which had been scattered over her existence, since she knew what feeling was, seemed gathered together in one pulsation now. The revulsion from her indignant mood a little earlier, when she had meditated upon compromised honour, forestalment, eclipse in maternity by another, was violent and entire. All that was forgotten in the simple and still strong attachment to wife and husband. She had sighed for her self-completeness then, and now she cried aloud against the severance of the union she had deplored. She flung her arms round Troy's neck, exclaiming wildly from the deepest deep of her heart, "'Don't! Don't kiss them! Oh, Frank, I can't bear it! I can't! I love you better than she did! Kiss me too, Frank! Kiss me! Will you, Frank, kiss me too?' There was something so abnormal and startling in the childlike pain and simplicity of this appeal from a woman of Bathsheba's calibre and independence, that Troy, loosening her tightly clasped arms from his neck, looked at her in bewilderment. It was such an unexpected revelation of all women being alike at heart, even those so different in their accessories as Fanny and this one beside him, that Troy could hardly seem to believe her to be his proud wife Bathsheba. Fanny's own spirit seemed to be animating her frame, but this was the mood of a few instants only. When the momentary surprise had passed, his expression changed to a silencing and imperious gaze. "'I will not kiss you,' he said, pushing her away. 
had the wife now but gone no further. Yet, perhaps, under the harrowing circumstances, to speak out was the one wrong act which can be better understood, if not forgiven in her, than the right and politic one, her rival being now but a corpse. All the feeling she had betrayed into showing she drew back to herself again by a strenuous effort of self-command. "'What have you to say as your reason?' she asked, her bitter voice being strangely low, quite that of another woman now. "'I have to say that I have been a bad, black-hearted man,' he answered. "'And that this woman is your victim, and I not less than she?' "'Ah, don't taunt me, madam. This woman is more to me, dead as she is, than ever you were, or are, or can be. If Satan had not tempted me with that face of yours and those cursed coquetteries, I should have married her. I never had another thought till you came in my way. Would to God that I had!' But it is all too late. He turned to Fanny then. But never mind, darling, he said. In the sight of heaven, you are my very, very wife. At these words there arose from Bathsheba's lips a long, low cry of measureless despair and indignation, such a wail of anguish as had never before been heard within those old inhabited walls. It was the terre liori of her union with Troy. "'If she is that, what am I?' she added, as a continuation of the same cry, and sobbing pitifully, and the rarity with her of such abandonment only made the condition more dire. "'You are nothing to me, nothing,' said Troy heartlessly. "'A ceremony before a priest doesn't make a marriage. I am not morally yours.' A vehement impulse to flee from him to run from this place, hide and escape his words at any price, not stopping short of death itself, mastered Bathsheba now. She waited not an instant, but turned to the door and ran out. End of chapter 43